Good morning! I am in Toronto, which is very exciting. This is my first time here. And I have a lot that I want to do today. I want to show you guys the Art Gallery of Ontario. There's a Matthew Wong exhibit there. I'm going to go to this place called The Power Plant, which is right on the water, which I'm excited to go see because I haven't been to the water yet. And going to hit up a few popular galleries from what I've been told. <laughs> so yeah, just going to get a little bit of a taste of the Toronto art scene, which I'm excited about. I got very lucky with the weather on this trip, I will say. I find Toronto to be a very walkable city, even though I will be Ubering to the east side to go to MoCA and some galleries later. But the first stop of our day is going to be the Art Gallery of Ontario. And this is a Frank Gehry building, so I'm pretty sure I'm going to love it regardless of what's inside. The gallery opened back in 2008, and it is not free. It is 25 Canadian dollars, but honestly, I felt like it was totally worth it. We're going to start on the first floor where we'll see the Matthew Wong exhibit as well as some of the modern art collection. So in full disclosure, the reason I wanted to visit the AGO in the first place was to see this Matthew Wong exhibit. I had no idea he was Canadian. He was born and grew up in Toronto. And I've had the pleasure of seeing his works in major art fairs, as well as Karma Gallery in New York. He was such a talented artist, and it's a shame that his career was cut so short. So this exhibit showcases 40 paintings from Wong's Blue series that he made during the final and what are considered to be the most productive years of his life. And despite being only 35 years old when he died, Wong apparently produced more than a thousand paintings on paper and canvas. What I also find really interesting is you can see the marks of a younger artist because of the varying techniques. It's like he's still experimenting and finding his signature. While his story is really heartbreaking, I think it's important to understand his past because it gives a lot of context to his works. So Matthew Wong dealt with a series of diagnoses. He was autistic, he had lifelong depression and Tourette's syndrome, and he took his own life in 2019. So this is why we see the color blue so frequently in these works, because for Wong, and honestly for many other artists such as Picasso, the color represented solitude and sadness. And most of the paintings are of interiors or of the great outdoors, and most are set at nighttime, because apparently this was a time of peace for Wong, so it makes sense why he would paint these settings repetitively.
This is a huge museum, so I wanted to show you all some of my favorite spots outside of the rotating exhibition spaces. This is their modern art collection, and it's really nice, honestly. I mean, who doesn't love a Franz Klein as well as a Cara Appel? There's a lot of big names from art history here, which is always a pleasure to see up close in person. And if you're not sure the difference between modern and contemporary art, it's honestly just the timeline of when it was produced. So modern art is a little older, it can be anything from roughly the 1860s to the 1970s. This was a nice little surprise. This is an installation by Hegu Young titled Emergence. And Young is a Korean artist and known for transforming everyday materials. So if you look closely, you can see that the sculpture is actually made up of Venetian blinds, light bulbs, drying racks, knitting yarn, and bells. We've now headed up to the fifth floor to see what everyone in Toronto has been calling the selfie exhibit, but it's actually an exhibit that looks at our quote, universal need to capture, share, and cherish the everyday. It's broken up into various themes, starting with homes. I knew this was gonna be a great show when the first work that you see is this piece by a Nigerian artist, Injadek Akunili Crosby. And I first saw her works at the last 2019 Venice Biennial. She's known for creating these domestic scenes to represent her life as an immigrant. The next theme is family, and they have this amazing large-scale Nicole Eisenman work. She is one of the most important female artists of our generation, in my opinion. This area is all about the superstar, and it is giving me major nostalgia. <laughs> Here's a picture that Marilyn Minter did of Miley Cyrus. Here is Kim Kardashian's selfie book. I don't know if you remember that at all. I can't remember what theme that this wall aligns to, but it's really impressive David Hockney work that spans the entire wall. God, it was just back in 2017 that he had a major retrospective at the Met. So it's nice to see his works again. This is a really impressive series of Jean-Michel Basquiat works that are part of a theme, My Favorite Things, which is about how the things we collect are representative of not only ourselves, but of the culture in general. I also love these tiny photographs by Patti Smith. There's honestly so much to see in this exhibit. This was just a 
tiny glimpse of it, but I thought it was a really impressive range of artists that they brought together. Even if you don't know anything about art, it's just a really enjoyable visual experience as well. Now we're gonna explore the AGO's contemporary art collection. And oh, we're starting off strong with plates from Judy Chicago's famous piece, The Dinner Party. And if you're not familiar with it, The Dinner Party is a famous art installation. It's probably one of the most recognizable, quote, feminist art pieces, but it's a triangular table that has 39 place settings of plates like this for mythical and historical famous women. And these six plates that the AGO acquired are for Eleanor Aquitaine, who was one of the most powerful women during the Middle Ages, Sacagawea, a woman who acted as an interpreter and a guide for Lewis and Clark across North America, Caroline Herschel, the first woman to discover a comet, and Elizabeth Blackwell, the first American woman to graduate from medical school. So definitely an impressive group. This is a sculpture by Canadian artist Valerie Blass, who uses photographs to create these three-dimensional pieces. This is a really nice Gerard Richter. This is a wall painting by Sandra Brewster, who's a Canadian artist based in Toronto, and her trademark is to take photo-based gel transfers and apply them directly to the wall, and then scrub the paper and glue away. And this is all meant to symbolize the, quote, fragility of her connection to these places as home. And so keep her in mind, we're going to see a lot more of her work later at the power plant. I do want to call out that the AGO has a really nice collection of indigenous arts, and these are works by Carl Beam, who's made history as the first artist of native ancestry to have his works purchased by the National Gallery of Canada as contemporary art. Overall, I was really impressed with the AGO, I will say. I could have spent all day there, the range of works they have in their collections. It's such a good mix of Canadian artists as well as some of the most famous global artists and artists from art history. So now we're gonna take a look at some public art before we head over to the Museum of Contemporary Art. This is a work by Jaume Plenza that sits right outside the Toronto Stock Exchange and the work is titled Dreaming and was created in 2017. And if you're not familiar with the artist, he is a Spanish artist and sculptor and he has well over 60 public sculptures all over the world. I love that his works are just instantly recognizable. There's very good chances that you've probably seen his works if you visited any major city. And he's really known for these sort of long face distorted heads. This is a work by one of China's most influential contemporary artists, Zhang Wan, and it's titled Rising. And two companies actually partnered with the Art Gallery of Ontario, where we just were, to have this built in 2012. And the sculpture seeks to convey, quote, that humans can exist in harmony with nature and that if this delicate balance is struck, our cities will become better places to live. He says, quote, the doves in the tree symbolize the peace in the world and my wish for this beautiful city life to be shared by mankind and nature. Now we're heading over to the east side of Toronto. It's a little over 30 minutes from downtown to visit the Museum of Contemporary Art. So you do have to pay to visit the MoCA. It's $10 Canadian dollars for one adult ticket, but totally worth it once again. And there are a handful of exhibits on display currently, but I'm gonna focus on three. And they're all on a separate floor, and I'm going to start with this one by Jeffrey Gibson. 
Kipson is a member of the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians and Half Cherokee. And immediately when viewing this installation, I feel like you're overwhelmed with color and pattern and text. And this is Gibson's signature. And he does this to, quote, amplify the voices of individuals and communities, both past and present. And if you look under each of these little cubbies, there are children's books. And these have been donated. And they, quote, prioritize indigenous, black, brown, and queer voices. And they're meant to, quote, speak to strategies of storytelling and what histories are remembered and how. And these are actually a lot more than reading nooks. They're actually many stages that can be moved around for performances that will be happening throughout the course of the exhibit. And something else I should call out is that this exhibit is part of the Toronto Biennial, which is happening now until June 5th. So some of the other exhibits that we'll see shortly are also a part of this. Now we're headed to the top floor to see an exhibit by Felix Gonzalez Torres. And his work is meant to help viewers, quote, understand the fragility and complexity of being alive. And honestly, he knew this better than anyone. He created works through the HIV and AIDS crisis, and he actually died from AIDS-related causes in 1996. In general, he's known for these minimalist installations created from everyday materials. So the strings of light bulb and the stacks of candy can be thought of as a metaphor for dying. Eventually the candy expires and the light bulbs burn out. And the candy in particular can be representative of the AIDS crisis. Renette Lorenz once said, quote, as a person eats the candy and throws it away, the pile decreases in size. And this represents how society ignored the existence of this epidemic, which led to the deaths of many gay people. We're now heading down a floor and they've actually started the exhibit in the stairwell. There's a sound installation, which is pretty cool. It sort of preps you for the exhibit to come. This is an exhibit by the Iranian artist Shirin Nishat. And her work is known for, quote, declaring the female presence in a male dominated culture. And this particular exhibit is titled Land of Dreams. And it focuses on, quote, global issues of displacement, migration, and geopolitical conflict. So the photographs on the wall are 111 portraits of people that Nishat encountered when traveling across New Mexico in 2019. And the Farsi text on the work is the sitter's name, date, and place of birth. She also asked each person to share a recent dream. And the video installation that you see is a fictionalized version of this. It shows a character that's based off of herself, traveling through New Mexico, recording people's dreams. And after hearing these dreams, she goes back to a secret Iranian society and looks at the dreams and then realizes that they're no different from ours. And the barriers between these two cultures start to crumble. And all of this is meant to represent how we all share the same hopes and desires across the world. And honestly, that we have more in common than different if we just took the time to understand one another. Now we're gonna head to some local galleries that are right around the corner from Mocha, but weirdly nested right in a very residential neighborhood. 
The first stop is Gallery TPW, and something I have noticed about Toronto galleries is that a lot of them are publicly funded and set up as organizations or charities. So you don't see as much commercial art like you do in New York. You see a lot of conceptual art because they don't really need to make money off of it by selling it. This is just my opinion, but I think sometimes the downside of this is that you get art that sometimes the public can't necessarily connect with as much or understand as easily. But this is an exhibit by Jesse Chun. The next stop is Daniel Faria Gallery, which is basically next door to TPW. And this is an exhibit by the Canadian artist Sarah K. Maston. And her works, quote, explore methods of animal communication that humans tend to overlook, such as inaudible sound waves, scents, or oscillations. So that's why you can see little snakes kind of placed throughout. And this painting, which is the largest in the show, is meant to represent a bat's viewpoint and what they would see when looking at a human. Now we're heading over to Mercer Union, which is an artist-run center featuring exhibits of contemporary Canadian and international works. I will say, I'm not normally the biggest fan of video art, but I actually really enjoyed this exhibit by Lawrence Abu Hamdan. It starts with the story of a cross-border shooting of an unarmed 15-year-old Mexican national in 2010 by a U.S. Border Patrol agent. The case was debated in the Supreme Court and ultimately the Border Patrol agent wasn't prosecuted because the U.S. was worried about the implications that the ruling would have on families impacted by U.S. drone strikes to seek justice. Then they talk about the Haskell Free Library and Opera House, which is a building that sits between the jurisdictions of Canada and the United States. And it became a haven for Iranian families to gather and meet that were impacted by Trump's travel ban in 2017. The paintings that you see when you walk in are actually backdrops like you would see in a theater, and they represent the different scenes that you watch in the video on the other side. We're now going back to the heart of downtown, right by the waterfront to visit the Power Plant, which is a public gallery that's been around since 1987, exhibiting contemporary art. And it is free, and I'm gonna show you two exhibits that are currently on view. 
I gave a little teaser back at the Art Gallery of Ontario, but this is an exhibit by the Toronto-based Canadian artist Sandra Brewster. And all of the works address the themes of place and belonging. And similar to the work we saw at AOC, this is one of her signature walls made up of drawing and photo-based gel transfer. And she's put the work directly on the wall. So there's equal feelings of permanence, but also temporariness. It's attached to the building, so there's a feeling of belonging. But on the other hand, we know it's a temporary exhibit that will eventually have to be painted over or removed. And Brewster is inspired to create these works about duality because of her experiences with living her life in Canada while also being closely tied to her Caribbean heritage. She believes, quote, as first generation Canadians, stories passed down from parents and loved ones, giving us a sense of belonging to a place in which we never have lived. So on these walls, she's created works inspired by, quote, memories that family members shared with her, interwoven with her own lived experiences. So this includes the Asequiba River in Guyana on one wall and a collage of Canadian and Guyanese forests on the opposite wall. The next exhibit we're gonna see is by the artist Sasha Huber. And there's a lot going on in this exhibit. There's video, there's sculpture, photography, and all of the works we see were created by Huber over the course of a decade and are inspired by the cultural and political campaign to demount Louise Agassiz. So for context, Louise Agassiz is a Swiss-born American biologist and geologist who is recognized as a scholar of Earth's natural history. But he has a pretty tarnished legacy because he believed in scientific racism or biological racism, among other controversial things. If you're not familiar with what biological racism is, it is the belief that there is a, quote, empirical evidence to support or justify racism, racial discrimination, racial inferiority, or racial superiority. So not really a good guy. So all the works in this exhibit are meant to, quote, challenge the terms by which we remember, asking not only who and what we memorialize, but also, and more importantly, how we do so. This is a second work by Sandra Brewster, and this is a sculpture called A Place to Put Your Things. She wanted it to be a, quote, place to rest and be at peace, to unburden oneself and simply sway at one's own pace and rhythm. Play being a central element of the work, the sculpture connects to an inner child and can be engaged by children and adults alike. I hope you enjoyed some highlights from the Toronto art scene. And if you're from Toronto, please let me know if I missed anything. Where are some of your favorite places to see art? And I will see you all in the next video.